and um, well, Council Member Jarinski is not a new member, but she was on the committee last year, but we do have Council Member Zavonik. Um, so, Lori, I know that you might have met with Council Member Zavonik, but if you before you do your presentation, could you just let him know a little bit about your background and how long you've been with the city working with the city on our legislative uh, federal legislative priorities? And then we'll move into the um, move into the agenda. Right. I think I've had an opportunity to meet, meet with you, City Council Member Zavani, but I'm really looking forward to um, working with y'all this year on the committee. Um, I'm at Holland and Knight. We're a large law firm. We have an um, office in um, Denver as well. We have our government lobbying um, practice is one of the biggest in the country, and we're based in D.C. Um, we're bipartisan. Uh, we represent a number of local governments, transportation agencies, or large utilities across the country. My background, I think I've been working with the city now eight years, Roberto. Sounds right. That's right. Um, and um, I represent other local governments and transportation agencies and large utilities too across the country. Um, before joining Holland and I, I worked in the Senate for um, the three Republican senators um, for 10 years. And I oversaw uh, the Transportation and Water Subcommittee at the Senate Environment and Public Works um, Committee. Um, so that's just a little bit of my background. Okay. Um, do you have any questions? Okay. And then I see Peggy on here before Peggy, we're, I'm just giving some introductions. I know you might have met with council member Zavonik, but I just wanted him before we get into the dive into the agenda, just to give him a little bit about your, about, you know, capital capital, how long, you know, the members, I know Totsi and Cami are part of that, but just to let council member Zavonik know a little bit of background. Sounds great. Uh, Peggy O'Keefe, I, I think we're both smiling because um, I knew um, Councilman uh, Zabonik when he worked at the state capitol years ago. So small world, uh, full circle now. Um, but great to see you again. Just as a refresher, um, Tatsi and I worked together with Cami Grant um in a bipartisan fashion down at the capitol representing the city of aurora we've been lucky enough to do it for several years now um and happy to join you again and having you as a part of this team so thank you okay well we're going to go ahead and get started and dive into the agenda but thank you all for being here we have no consent items approval of the minutes um, I know Council Member Zavonik and Jarinski were not on the committee. Just a, um, a clarification, or maybe do I need to get the other council member who was on here to approve these, or are we good to go ahead and approve them? We're good to go ahead and approve them. I'll give okay. them to Marcano just to make sure that he sees them since he was elected. Okay, I just want to make sure if there's any revision. So we'll go ahead and approve them as is. Um, okay, Lori, federal update. Sure, and I apologize, I did not mention my two other colleagues. Rich Gold, who's in charge of our lobbying group, is also part of the team. Um, he's worked for, for several Democratic senators and also worked for um, President Clinton at EPA. And then my other colleague is Leslie Poner, and she works well, works with NLC a lot, and also community development and housing. So sorry, I forgot to mention that. Okay, DC, nothing's going on. We have a speaker now, um, so now the House can start getting organized. Over the past week, um, the committee, they've been organizing who's going to be chair and members of the committees. Um, they started off, they call um, type A, uh, the uh, committee A's, which means those are the major committees like Ways and Means and Financial Services and that sort of thing. Well, they'll finish um, naming um, the chairs and ranking members and members over the next few weeks. They are in recess right now uh, until um, January 23rd. The Senate is also in recess. When the Senate returns, they will start announcing their committee chairs, ranking members as well. Um, the State of the Union is a little delayed this year. It's going to be on February 7th. Shortly after that, we expect the president to release his budget for FY24. This is a messaging document. Um, regardless who's in charge of the administration or Congress, Congress usually ignores it um, and does their own thing, uh, but it's a messaging document showing what the president's prioritizing, both in policy and funding over the next year. After he presents his budget, Congress is going to begin the appropriations process. And as you recall, um, with um, two new members, um, we were fortunate enough to get funding for the MLK Library last year, and also something for more water, but new additional water main lines, which is great that we were 
who got two earmarks. Um, so right now the city is working internally on their earmark, what we're going to submit this upcoming year. And the congressional members um, will start to issue forms, which will work closely together to um, fill out and submit to the congressman and the two senators. I am also working on our upcoming visit. It's exciting for finally being able to visit DC. So I've been working with Liz on on the various delegation members. I got your notice, Angela, about me with EJA, um, Bureau of Justice Assistance at DOJ, where my colleagues has a great relationship with that office, so I'm definitely setting that up too. Then other federal agencies um, like the Air Force, Department of Transportation, because I know the city is looking forward to applying um, for grants um, that were created in the bipartisan infrastructure bill. This is the second year of the bipartisan infrastructure bill funding. Um, DOT and EPA are trying to get out their notice of funding opportunities, otherwise known as NOFOs, out really quickly this year, um, with the first, within the first quarter of this year. So, uh, we have a running calendar I send over to Liz on a weekly basis on a tracker showing when we expect the NOFOs to come out or when they um, are actually come out and then um, to help your staff, the city, plan for what they're going to play for. I think that's all I have right now. I'm trying to think of deep because they're really just getting organized right now. No policy yet or um, legislation at this point. Oh, the only other thing I forgot to um, say, I'm sorry, is that the House and Senate are expected to get the FAA authorization bill done. I know, Angela, you closely follow, work closely with the um, Denver Airport. This bill has always been done well on a bicameral, bipartisan um, basis, which I can't say for every bill. So they're hoping to get that done this year, as well as with the farm bill. So this is also additional funding, obviously, for USDA, but also includes money for SNAP, food stamps, and those sort of programs. So they're hoping to get that done this year, too. Um, on the House side, um, I met with um, the Transportation Committee Republican staff last week. And they're definitely planning to do a lot of oversight of how local governments are spending their money from COVID, how they're spending their bipartisan infrastructure bill money too, and then also oversight of how the administration is administering um, these grants. And with such a close majority in the House side, I don't know if they're going to actually get a lot of things done because in the Senate, um, there's a tight majority, but it requires 60 votes to get anything done in the Senate. So just because a House is passing a bill, it doesn't mean it's going to the Senate. So there, this might be a um, line of Congress this year and getting things done, but hopefully we'll get FAA over the finish line. So any questions? Is there any questions from the committee, Council Member Zavonik or Council Member Jarinski? Can I ask a question? And, and mostly just to put something on, on your radar, Lori. Um, so one of the, the big priorities or something that we're working on at the city is um, homelessness. And one of the challenges we have is the fact that the federal government is a fairly prescriptive, one size fits all policy around housing first. Um, and what I would hope, and I know there, there was legislation introduced in the previous Congress. It's like, I think it's called housing first or housing plus. It's, it's essentially um, an expansion of um, options available through, for funding um, uh, through HUD for homeless services so that you can include behavioral health, addiction and recovery support, and it's not just focused on housing. Housing is still part of it, but that's why it's called Housing Plus. One of the things I believe that's critical for us to be successful in the city is to have that flexibility from Washington, whether it come in way of block grant or change federal law so that there isn't a preference to Housing First, but instead um, money that's flowing through HUD, the billions of dollars can come to state and local governments and allow us to be laboratories of democracy and try things that are working instead of continuing to pour money into a failed which is what we've seen far too often in cities like San Francisco. So um, if you hear, I guess my, my ask is, is, is your, I know you watch a lot of things, if this would be something that you could keep on your radar. Um, and if you see opportunities to, for us to work with um, because of the select majorities and the requirement of 60 Republicans and Democrats, right? This is, this is really is a nonpartisan issue. Um, oh. right? So I think that if there's an opportunity to work to make our case for why this flexibility, I think, could be transformational for our city, I appreciate it. That's all. Absolutely. And I'm going to check and see um, the prospects of that bill getting done this year. 
Um, and there was also a lot of housing um, funding included in inflation, inflation reduction act, uh, which is sort of what we call the social infrastructure. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill was um, surface transportation, actual infrastructure, and then they passed this bill. So there's additional funding opportunities there. When the city has come to DC and met with a delegation, I do, I think Roberto could echo this, it's looked as a role model, how creative you've done, you've been in spending funding on um, housing, including the marijuana tax. Sorry, just to be clear, I, I want to spend less on housing and more on treatment. I want to help. Yeah, people. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. absolutely. No, no, no. I'm just saying that you have been very creative in housing services and wraparound. That the um, delegation is very appreciated. Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to look at the prospects of that bill. Thank you. See what happens. Okay. Is there any other further questions from the committee? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Lori. We look forward to working with you this year, and we'll see you soon. Sounds good. Have a great weekend. You too. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda is going to be our state legislative update. Liz, or are you going to start us off? I know we have some things to talk about in your memo. Or are we just going to have Peggy go first with just kind of giving a general update? Peggy is going to go first, and then then I will go and we'll talk about some of the items I've put in the agenda packet. Okay. Okay, Peggy. Great, thank you. Um, so we've started our 100 day, 120 day legislative session. Um, we've gotten through the first week, which is great. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few bills that we expect to see this session, um, especially for um, Councilman Zivonik and um, Councilwoman Jurinsky. Um, we've talked a little bit about this over the last couple of meetings. Um, but just want to give you guys a bit of a preview of what we're expecting to see. Um, we've been talking with our delegation and other legislators about modernizing and removing gaps in information in the statewide case management system and municipal courts. So we are working with CML on legislation to modernize that technical um, system and put together a study over the interim that will make recommendations to the legislature. Um, I know the city of Golden is looking at doing um, legislation for enforcement of noise um, violations for unmuffled vehicles. They're looking for a sponsor on that legislation right now. We expect to see legislation on red light cameras and photo radar again this session. Um, Representative Mayberry um, is going to bring uh, legislation that prevents local governments from um, passing legislation on camping. So the Right to Rest Act that we've seen in the past is likely to come back this session. Um, the governor's office is looking at legislation to address affordable housing and um, take away some of the local control, local authority issues around land use um, and focusing on transportation oriented development um, and looking at some of the zoning ordinances that are in place in a lot of local governments. We'll likely see legislation around red flag laws um, and expanding that statute to include DAs, therapists, doctors, um, who might be able to seek a red flag order. Probably we'll see legislation about fentanyl, additional gun legislation this session. Um, there is a sales and use tax um, bill that's coming that came out of the task force um, that addresses simplification, notifications, improvements in the data accessibility um, for businesses' ability to file through the um, state set system. We're going to see broadband legislation that will repeal Senate Bill 152. And that's a le legislation that passed um, in the early 2000s that said that local governments have to go to a vote of the people to um, compete with, with private companies to provide broadband. There's going to be a repeal of that legislation through the Office of Information Technology. Um, there will likely see, be legislation around the retail delivery fee 
um, and conversations about the definition of that and how small businesses can more easily comply with that. Um, vehicle theft legislation, um, this will remove the $2,000, um, I think it's a floor really, on when a felony um, can be charged against um, vehicle theft. Um, there is going to be legislation around the, um, I can't say this word, psychosyllabin, the mushroom um, initiative that passed this last November. They'll be enacting legislation around that, that local govern govern governments are going to want to watch closely to make sure um, that they have similar authority that they do around um, liquor licenses or marijuana licenses. We're going to see a no-knock warrant um, legislation that Senator Fields is going to be bringing. It came out of the um, task force that has been meeting on that, but I think she's going to go beyond that and um, allow restitution um, to be sought. We'll also see legislation um, to address elections. Um, there was a situation in Florence where the city council had all resigned and there was nobody to call for the election. So we're going to see legislation that would add language that says that a municipal clerk can set an election date if city council has all resigned and there's nobody available to call it. We've got CORA legislation um, that we've got a draft of and we're working internally through that language. Um, and then we will also see um, legislation potentially around wildfire codes um, and that, how those impact local government. So it's going to be a real busy session. As you know, um, the Democrats have a supermajority in the House and practically a supermajority in the Senate. They're one vote away. A lot of new progressives were elected to the state legislature. Um, so leadership has really tried to um, find ways to keep um, some of those um, more progressive folks at bay in terms of bringing legislation um, that may be negative against uh, local governments and business. Um, we'll see. I think it's going to be a pretty challenging session um, in the upcoming 115 days now. Hey, thank you, Peggy. That's a lot. That's a lot going on. I know it's going to be very robust and a lot of things are going to be happening this year. So it's going to be pretty fast and heavy on a lot of issues. Councilmember Zavonik and Councilmember Jarinski, do you have questions? Councilmember um, Jarinski. Yeah, Peggy. Also, too, I do know that there are 2 bills um, coming forward that have to do with uh, DHS and CPS. Um, so Child Protective Services and Department of Human Services. Um, I know that there are 2 bills. Uh, coming forward, can we also can, can we be on the lookout for those specifically also to come to this committee? Yes, you bet. Okay, thank you. You bet. Let me do a little bit of digging around and I'll um, get some additional information to you and Liz about those. So you want my help? Um, if you want, it, um, if you want my help finding them, I, I can give you the information as well. But I just want to make sure they come to this committee. You bet. Thank you. Yeah. Council Member Zavonik. Thank you, uh, Peggy. I look forward to working with you. Um, and I know there's a lot of um, a lot of issues that you're already tracking. A couple of things that cross my mind as you're going through this is, and I know we're going to have a conversation later about the bed cap. Um, I'm, I plan to bring motion for this committee to consider that would um, recommend that the city take a position of eliminating the bed cap. I understand, given the composition of the general assembly, that is not my that's the right policy. Um, people are living. Community because of policy, so I want to make sure that we watch um, track the, the juvenile bed cap is what I'm referring to. Yep. Um, the the other thing is I know that there has been at least conversations, and I don't know if the bill has been drafted or I know it's been drafted, but maybe not introduced. Um, that deals with the service sector, um, and and it's I think it's called the Fair Work Week, and it's where you are not you can't have on call employees. 
Um, huge problem um, for our service industry. I think that that would be a, a big detriment to our employers um, here. So I just want to make sure that that's on our radar. Um, I think that the type of union should be that we should actively oppose it, assuming it, it makes um, its way forward in a, in a serious way. I know there's a lot of conversations around property tax. The reason I bring this up is that we hear from our residents, they're, they're worried about crime, they're worried about the cost of living. Um, people are mad about the bag fees, the, the delivery fees, the gas fees that are on their way. And property tax is going to be an enormous um, sticker shock. To repeal Gallagher will amount to the largest tax increase in Colorado history by far. And I know they're throwing some time dollars at it with tape refunds trying to offset it, but it's not going to get anywhere near the amount of money that's needed. And so I'm hopeful that there's conversations around a cap or something um, on residential rates. But if, again, if there's conversations around property tax, it might, it might not be something we would typically watch, but just given the cost of living is such a high priority that we're going to have to make sure that we're on top of it. And then the last one is just referred measures. It's another way where given, as you mentioned, the supermajority nature of this legislature, um, if they decide that they want to put something on that maybe the governor's office didn't like, they could do it. They don't need his signature um, to get something on the ballot. And so whether it's a, a full repeal of our unions that were touted as a way to uh, provide cost of living relief to all Coloradans last year, and now potentially um, going to be coming down. So those types of, just any other referred measures that might be coming down the pike, just a uh, heads up, would be something that I'd be interested in making sure that we have insight on. Excellent, you bet. And then Peggy and uh, Roberto and Liz, for you, um, you know, I, I sit on the CML Executive Board and the CML Policy Committee, but I'm also on the Subcommittee for Policing and Courts. So I need to make sure that I'm working with our police department, our public safety, about any kind of bills that are coming there because I'll be kind of the voice on that subcommittee. So that's going to be, I'm just adding that to it. We have our first meeting next week on the 19th. So just letting Judge Day know, and um, I see, you know, Chief Hildebrand here as well. Um, you pr pr please put things on my radar because um, I do sit on that subcommittee. Okay, is there anything else from the committee members um, for Peggy? Peggy, you gave us a lot. We got a lot that we're gonna. We have a whole hundred and fifteen days. So um, drink your coffee. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna need it. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, I guess Liz, I'm gonna let you. Proceed with moving forward on the next three things that we need to discuss. Yes. So, hi, everyone. My name is Liz Rogers. I don't think I've met some of you in person yet, um, but it's great to be working with you. So, what I brought forward for you today is um, some different legislative policy recommendations brought and uh, kind of informed to us by city departments on what bills we would like to take a active or supportive ask position on. Um, the document is arranged in a way where it tells you all of the information you should be able to know about it, bill name, sponsors, a summary, the condition recommendation by the city department, as well as the rationale behind that decision. So um, if everyone's okay, I thought we could go through them one by one, have a discussion. If there are any questions, I can help answer them or feel them or get you more information as we go on. Does that sound good? Great. Okay. Uh, so the first bill coming up is Senate Bill uh, 23001, Authority of Public-Private Collaboration Units for Housing. Um, essentially, this would encourage more public-private collaborations and partnerships when developing housing around the state. Um, our city departments say that this additional flexibility could be really helpful for financing housing deals, especially as Aurora continues to grow and develop. The position recommendation is to actively support this legislation. Um, and then is there any discussion, agreement, or disagreement with this position recommendation? Okay, for my colleagues, Council Member Zavonik and Council Member Jarinski, um, this is how I kind of do this. Um, first of all, do you have any questions on this? Or comments. Council member. Zavonik and Jarinski. Oh, sorry. No. no. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Council member Jarinski. Do you have any comments or on this before we take, I ask for a position. Okay. Council member Zavonik. What's your position? Do you accept the position of actively support? Do you hear me? 
I can hear you now. Oh, I'm sorry. I said yes. I'm sorry. I said yes. I, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Hear. It was a pause, so I, I didn't oh, hear oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I was fine with that. I was reading down it, and yeah, go ahead. But yes. Okay. Maybe the you were okay. keeping us in suspense, Dustin. We were really yeah, waiting for you. Really, wow, he's, a, he's really a helping nervous. Up, uh, yeah, yeah, I building up it. the suspense. I, I know, like, and I saw your on? face. I was getting a little nervous. Okay, uh, Councilmember Jurinsky, do you support the city's position of active leave support? I'll say it louder than Dustin. Yes. Okay, and I support as well. So we'll Great. move to the next one, Liz. Okay, the next one is Senate Bill 23-018, ongoing funding for 911 resource centers. Um, essentially, this would provide ongoing funding for Colorado 911 services. Um, the, position rash, the position recommendation is actively support. And then essentially, this funding really does help Aurora in our own 911 resource centers um, and continue funding for the 911 resources that we provide. Um, are there any questions? Did you, did you say Senate Bill 8? uh 018 it's the next one in the document i don't have it on here i have two it goes from uh one it's, to two it's right underneath um if you look underneath the first one council member zavonic oh, yeah. it's right it's, oh do you see it now no okay um she has it right underneath rationale and it goes bill name right after the first one got it are you looking on eScribe? What are you? I'm on a computer, so. I'm on the, yeah, I'm on the the link that was sent, and I have the Senate Bill one. Um, it, it's all in the agenda. Um, that was distributed. It's not in that. It's not on the link. The tracking sheet link. It's no. on the tracking sheet, but the ones, um, the bills that I wanted to bring forward are ones that are positioned for either actively support or support if asked. We don't have any opposed bills at this moment in time, um, so they are in the document that was attached to the agenda. Okay, I'll open that. I was looking at the tracking sheet. Do you want me to defer to Councilmember Jurinsky yeah, while yep. you look at it? Yeah. Look at that one. Would. Yes, if you would. Okay, Councilmember Jurinsky, what's your do you have any questions or comments on this on Senate Bill 230018 funding for 911 resource center? Uh, I mean the way that it's being the way that I read it, I support it. Okay. I support as well. And then we're just waiting for Councilmember Zavani. I found it. I found it. I was looking for 08, not 18. That was my softball. So yes, there it's there. I, I'm good with it. Okay, so we all support. So we'll move on to the next one, Liz. Okay, so the next section I have for you guys is um, basically support if asked. Uh, so this is not actively support. This is kind of a changing in policy position. Um, the first one for support if asked is Senate Bill 23003, Colorado Adult High School Program. Um, essentially, this bill would create a Colorado Adult High school program um, and kind of coordinate with other nonprofit entities in order to provide this service. Um, the rationale for this position is that all of these, um, most of the people that are sponsoring this bill are our local electeds and would like to support, um, have the city support on this. So there's nothing that really we need to do, but um, it is good for relationship building. Councilmember Zavonik and Councilmember Jurinsky, do you have any questions? And then what's your position on this? you support the city staff's position of just when asked, support if asked? Yes, no questions and yes. Okay, Council Member Jurinsky. Same. Okay, and I'm also support the position. Okay, uh, the next bill is um, House Bill 231017, Electronic Sales and Use Tax Simplification System. Peggy mentioned this in um, her discussion, but this is the bill that kind of came out of that um, uh, sales tax and use committee detailing more about um, modifying the um, the local taxing jurisdictions um, and kind of providing more simplification on the issue. Um, the bill is supported by our financing department um, with the rationale support if asked. Council Member um, Zabonik and Jurinsky, do you have questions? And then what is your position? Do you support the staff position? Questions, yes. Okay, Councilmember Jurinsky. Same. And I'm yes as well. Great. 
And the last bill I have for you all today is House Bill 1042, Admissibility Standards for Juvenile Statements. Um, so basically, this bill makes any statement or admission attained during a juvenile custodial integration um, in which law enforcement officials knowingly use deception. You can read it all in the summary. It's a little lengthy. Um, but this is one that Judge Day, Judge Day has brought forward and would like to provide further discussion on with the position recommendations for if asked. So um, I guess, Judge Day, if you want to provide additional rationale and information, we can just do that now. Sure. Thanks, Liz. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, members of the committee. This bill mirrors Senate Bill 22023 from last year, um, which made it through both the House and the Senate, um, took some time in appropriations, um, and, but then eventually died on the calendar. And so they're reintroducing it um, with a different bill title from Senate Bill 2223. Um, um, I put comment in um, our internal bill um, review um, to where it does in a way, the bill itself does in a way um, codify um, the current case law, although there are some, some pretty drastic differences. One being that it creates the presumption under current law right now, um, the lead case Jackson v. Deno, and there's several cases here in Colorado, it's the prosecution's responsibility and they must meet uh, the burden of, of uh, establishing the voluntariness of a statement and or confession by a preponderance of the evidence. Here, this bill kind of switches it a little bit into that it's just presumed to be inadmissible and then they have to, um, prosecution has to meet the standard. Uh, it also adds some things that are in conflict with current law and that is the, the degree of coercion or misstatement during the course of interrogation. Um, that's a factor in any decision that the court must take in viewing the totality of the circumstances as to the confession or the statement as to what degree uh, the misstatement was, to what degree the coercion was. All other uh, attended circumstances that were present at the time of, of the statement or the uh, the confession. And we have to look at it in a totality of the circumstances. This bill kind of, um, as it says and as it's written, one misstatement or one act of coercion will make the statement in, uh, inadmissible. That's not current law, and so you need to know that. And I think that's what really caused a lot of disagreement with Senate Bill 22023. Um, Senate Bill 22023 basically passed upon partisan uh, party line vote um, last year. I anticipate that it would do the same this year. Um, so I just wanted to point that out to the committee that there is disagreement with the bill. Um, there was disagreement, I should say, back in uh, last year's session. I anticipate there will be disagreement with those factors or those parts of the bills as well. So I'd, I'd like to bring that to the committee's attention and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I'll go ahead and defer to Councilmember Zavonik and Councilmember Jarinski. Do you have any questions for Judge Day? And then I have a question as well. Yeah, just one question. Uh, thanks for that information, one. But do you happen to know um, where the district attorneys or the CADC is on this? Were they opposed to it last year? Um, I assume so. Um, and just reading the description, it doesn't seem like something that prosecutors would get behind um, for the for the reasons that you described, which is that it creates a very high bar for any um, in terms of throwing out admissible testimony, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm stretching my memory. I don't um, going back to the full legislative history of 22023, I believe you're correct. I believe they were in opposition of the bill, um, but don't quote me on that. I believe that's the case because I think they had the same concerns that I just addressed with the difference in case law and the and the, the wording of the bill. Councilmember Jarinski, do you have a question? No. Okay, um, I see Doug Wilson on here. Doug, do you have any comments on this bill? I mean, I see you on here. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, I think I think what Judge Day just uh, set forth is is correct. I think um, it there was some discussion. I think there was some opposition from the CDAC last year, uh, but I'm not whatever the percentage is. Ninety percent of it is already established law, 
uh, because it's a juvenile. And, th and that's, I think, where um, the, the sort of proverbial rubber hits the road is because these are kids they're trying to, who would be more easily influenced. I think that's why the one act of, con of um, coercion came into play. Okay. Okay, and then Judge Day, I know we had some discussion on this bill last year. Um, right now we have a supportive ask position. Um, based on what you just stated, I mean, is it, are, I know last year there was some conversations that you and I had as well on the position of this, of SB 22023. So I'm just kind of making sure supportive asked, even though there's going to be some debate on it, you still believe that we should be in that well, position? I I, I think we should probably go just to more and, and I would like to change my recommendation to a monitor position just to see how this goes and what the the presentation is um, at committee and what the arguments would be in support and in opposition. So I, I would recommend at least that would be my position to go to a more of a monitor position until we see um, how how uh, the issues are brought forth before the committees. Okay, um, to my colleagues, um, Councilmember Jarinski and Councilmember Zavonik, would you uh, support uh, Judge Day's recommendation of the position of monitoring instead of support if asked? Yes. Yeah, I'm fine with doing that for now. I mean, based on the information that we have today and my, my fears and some of the flaws in our juvenile justice system as they stand, I would probably want to oppose, but I think what Judge Day just said is reasonable, and let, let's wait and see how the conversation proceeds before we take a hard um, yes or no position. I certainly can't see us taking yes, but monitor seems to make sense at this point. Okay, and I will support the monitoring position um, as um, suggested by Judge Day. So, Liz, can we make sure that that position recommendation is at a monitoring position? Yes, I will change that based on Judge Day's recommendation and then all of your votes as well. Um, this is that was the last bill that I had to bring forward to the committee today. Um, are there any additional questions for me or things that you would like to see in the future? Um, Council Member Zavonik and Council Member Jarinski, um, is there any other things that you would like for Liz or Peggy to track while we're on this particular topic of the state legislative update? Beyond the ones that we discussed with Peggy. Yeah, not beyond with what, what um, we outlined with Peggy. Okay, Council Member Jarinski, same thing, or you have any additional? Yeah, same. Okay. Okay. We'll go to uh, cases of domestic violence in municipal court, the draft bill. Judge Day, um, you want to present on this? Yes, thank you. And I think I, I, I hope that the committee received a copy of the draft bill that I was given um, on um, Wednesday. Um, we learned of this draft bill or this proposed um, bill um, over the weekend. Um, a group of the other judges and I met uh, to talk about the issue. We quickly reached out to try to set up a meeting with uh, Majority Leader Duran um, and also Representative Mike Weissman, um, who represents Aurora. Um, we were able to set up a meeting on Wednesday. I reached out to the committee, got permission to go down. We did receive a copy of the bill for the very first time. This is the first time that we've seen this bill. We have not been contacted. Uh, Prior to the draft bill in any way, there hasn't been any um, reach or outreach by anybody to talk about the issue until we reached out to set up the meeting with Majority Leader Duran. Um, we met myself, presiding judge for Westminster, a judge from Lakewood, um, the, the legislative um, liaison lobbyist that we have for CMJA. There was a couple other groups that were in the room as well, in addition to House Majority Leader Duran and Rep Weissman. House Majority Leader Duran started out the meeting um, by way of introduction and then um, went into the statement to say that she believed as a domestic violence survivor that all domestic violence cases should be prosecuted in state court specifically the type of cases that we have in county court. Um, she believed that there were issues relating to uh, the application of the Victims' Rights Amendment, um, applications of the Brady Bill federally, uh, whether or not municipal courts were enforcing and requiring forfeiture of weapons um, and the enforcement of those forfeiture orders. Um, she really just believed that 
the proper place for domestic violence was in county court. Rep Weissman had some similar type, type of statements, and then it was turned over for us to provide input and our thoughts. Um, Judge Flanagan from Lakewood started, um, followed by Judge Lontine and then myself to provide our thoughts and, and concerns about moving it over to county court. Um, a couple of the groups that were there, one particular representative um, provided her input. One of the things that we wanted to point out, it was the misinformation about the, the, the Brady bill not applying to municipal court convictions. That used to be the case, but it is not now. That bill was amended in 2022 to include federal, state, tribal courts, or local courts, which would now be municipal courts. That was added after an opinion from the 10th Circuit, the Pollard decision in 2017. So the Brady bill does, the Brady bill does apply to municipal convictions. And so they were not aware of that, including that particular um, group that was providing information to uh, House Majority Leader Duran. They didn't know that it had been amended, but it, it had been amended. So it does apply. And one of the things that we pointed out to um, House Majority Leader Duran and Rep Weissman was the, the, the strong position of uh, CMJA, the Municipal Judges Association, that the VRA, the Victims' Rights Amendment, should apply to municipal courts for any, for any charge that would fall within the VRA classification. And for us, that would be domestic violence cases. We are unified as at least from an association standpoint that the VRA should apply to municipal courts. And we had a lot of discussion about that particular issue. Um, I hope that that there would be consideration to that you know, because they are looking for uniformity of application to the VRA to domestic violence cases. And we completely understand that. And the VRA just requires the prosecution to um, uh, include the victim in each and every stage of the prosecution of the case, each and every court date, reach out to them, connect with them, provide them with the dates, um, provide information. Um, so I, I would hope that this committee would also be in support of, of that particular position. Um, there was other discussion about um, whether or not our court, municipal courts, enforce forfeiture orders for domestic violence cases, and we do. We have the identical orders to the state court, both district and county court. When it comes to um, domestic violence cases, each and every case has a, a protective order entered, and those orders are standard, um, in one being that you cannot possess a firearm or ammunition during the course of the prosecution of the case, and also if, there, if it is known that the that the the defendant has a uh, a weapon there's a forfeiture order entered in each and every case they must forfeit the weapon within 24 hours provide proof by way of affidavit within 72 hours that happens in every one of our cases and so there was some misinformation about whether or not municipal courts are doing that all municipal courts that are handling domestic violence cases they are doing that and then there was a question by one of the, the groups as to the enforcement of that forfeiture order and how that would take place. And, and, and it was Judge Flanagan along with myself and Judge Lontine that said it would be the same way that it would be enforced in county court, the same exact way. And if they don't comply, they can face forfeiture of their bond, they can face uh, contempt charge potentially, they could face new charges. And so it's enforced just the exact same way as the county court. So there wouldn't be any difference. We, we pointed out the long um, standing program that we've had here in Aurora for 35 plus years. We were one of the first courts. In fact, our court program was followed nationally by some cities. San Diego followed. They came out at the time when we did our fast track pro program with domestic violence, and they watched to see how our court does fast track uh, prosecution of domestic violence cases. Many other courts did too. From when we started the fast track, all courts are now doing domestic violence on a fast track system. One of the things that we pointed out in our meeting was is that if it was to move be moved to the county court, it would be prosecuted within a six month period. We do it in less than that. We do it in 91 days. And so we bring resolution to the case 
on a shorter speedy trial time. We pointed out all of the advantages of keeping the cases here in municipal court, and those are just some of, I don't want to, um, you know, take up all the time of this committee by telling you exactly every single conversation that took place, but that was the, that was the, the, the the gist of the of the of the conversation that we had with House Majority Leader Duran and Representative Wiseman. It's a big concern for our court because it would it would take the local control away from us um, and put it into the state courts. Happy to answer any questions. I have a question, yeah, Councilmember Jarinski. So I, I mean, I genuinely want to know the answer to this. You said that, you know, it, in a DV case, there's automatic gun for, forfeiture. If one party is saying, I know he or she has a gun, you know, then you guys demand forfeiture. But what if that party doesn't, doesn't have a gun? And that's something that's just being thrown out there. Uh, and, and, you know, and the person accused is saying, I don't, I don't have a gun. That, then yeah, that's a great question. If, if it's not determined that the person has a firearm, um, there are times where we'll enter the order just to say, um, you know, you got to provide proof that we'll actually take that back. If the if let's just say a victim of domestic violence is saying that I know that he has a gun, and the person that's standing before you, the the defendant is saying that I don't. Um, Law enforcement can look into the registration as to whether or not they have a registered gun or not and find out if that information is in fact true or not. That can be done in any court level as well. If we find out that that person does have a gun, then um, that person could be facing a contempt um, citation for this statement to the court at the time that they don't have a gun. They could face further prosecution for false statement to a judge. A, um, if under oath, which sometimes it could be, they could be put under oath, they could face a perjury charge as well. So there, they, there is further uh, check that you can, you can have as to whether or not the person actually has a firearm, and you can check those registries. I just find that interesting because by law, you don't, I mean, you don't actually have to register guns. I mean, you have to go through, you know, a background check and everything like that. Um, but I could have bought a gun 10 years ago that I no longer have. Um, so that's an interesting, right. I, find that, I find that interesting because you don't actually have to register um, a weapon. Well, I was just curious. I was just honestly curious. No, and there's other ways to do it. I mean, it would be to where there would just be further evidence provided that the person does in fact have a gun. And there's different ways that you can imagine that that can be done, right? So, but but the the point is this: it's the same thing in our court as it would be in county court. Oh, oh, absolutely. And I'm not taking that. I I genuinely, knowing that you don't have to register guns, I genuinely wanted to know what happens in a situation where one party is saying, "I know he or she has a gun." Um, the other party saying, I don't have a gun. I just, I just was curious. It, and you're right. It does happen that you're exactly right. We've had many a hearing as to, okay, do you, or do you not have a gun? And, but, and again, the, to me, the point is, 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 and we do try to do the best that we can, but we're only left with the information that's provided to the court, right? As to whether or not that person does have a gun and whether or not there is a need for that forfeiture order. Right, um, right. It can be a challenge. You're right. You're exactly right. Yeah, I was just curious. I wasn't taking. I, sure. yeah. I just was honestly curious how that goes down. No, no, yeah, no. It's a great question. Councilmember Zavonic, do you have any questions for Judge Day? Um, is has the legislation been introduced, or is this just a draft? Just a draft. It's just a draft. Yeah. Okay. Still in draft. Yep. Okay. So I, I, I just my. Uh, oh, Peggy, were you going to add something? I was. Um, I just reached out to a couple of the domestic violence lobbyists to try to track down whose bill it was. They're in the middle, middle of stakeholder processes right now. She said they're going to continue those and then figure out what Majority Leader Duran and Representative Wiseman want to do. So I'll I'll keep on top of them and get any insight there. Okay. Councilmember Lawson. 
Yes, council members. So I guess I would just, um, as this moves forward and, and assuming we have something, I would, you know, obviously I'd like to monitor it. Um, I, I don't know that I would have a position personally one way or the other yet, because I think the, the key questions are, um, you know, what's the best outcomes for victims? I think that's the key uh, question that I would have. And then looking at the, the cost to the Aurora taxpayers versus counties and knowing what the RDAs think. I think there's only uh, Judge Day, you and I talked about things, five cities in the state that actually do domestic violence were one of them. Um, most of this goes to county. That's not to say that that's the right way to do it, but just make sure that we really flush that out because um, I have all the confidence in the world in you and your team. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best process for um, our city. So I just want to make sure that we, as, as this moves forward, we take into consideration, um, you know, the, the positions of the DA and then what, what are the different outcomes, um, possibilities, if any, if there's any difference whatsoever. And um, just from my perspective, I reached out to, well, me and um, Representative Wiseman had a conversation last night. Um, I just wanted to ask him where this was coming from. And he basically told me it was due to a lot of things that he heard over the years from these advocacy groups. Because I was just trying to make sure that was it just coming from from one perspective or where was he, why was he, why was this bill coming forward? Um, he did tell me that it's still kind of in a draft form, uh, like you mentioned, Peggy, and that, you know, they do have to look at the fiscal note too. Um, so it's gonna be a lot of different things on this particular bill. I think we need to monitor for sure. Judge Day, I just had a question for you. Um, when we're talking, I'm just reading the summary here. Um, it doesn't matter any DV case. It could be even um, young juveniles, because you know juveniles are, they have domestic violence too. Is it just any any no matter the age or anything? Is that correct? It would go to county. Yeah, I think it's a strict prohibition. Okay. Everything would be any DV would be filed to um, into county. Okay. Or if it's juvenile, it'd be in, into the the juvenile dock at the juvenile court district court. Okay. And and then Judge Day, we talked before um, before we got this bill, this summary, and you were stating something that probably from the legislative or the legislative or the federal level, we need to look at the Brady Bill. Um, I, I did have a concern about that, but okay. going back and look at looking at it, and I apologize, I didn't mean mis mislead you or the rest of the committee members. The Brady Bill does apply to municipal okay. court, so okay. that's okay. Not, not an issue any longer. Okay. All right. Thank you, Judge Day. I appreciate the um, presentation. Is there any other further questions or um, from the committee to Judge Day on this particular um, draft or summary? Nothing from me. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Council Member Day. Lawson. Yes. Just from a law enforcement perspective, oh, I think with Chief. the amount of domestic violence cases that we do get and our officers end up going out on, it's mm -hmm. typically the process for Handling those cases within the municipal courts is, uh, is I wouldn't say easier, but the process is in place. Um, are that they're not very, they're not as time consuming as it is as filing these cases into the county court with affidavits and the the the, the summons. And not that that should be a factor in this, but I think it's something to consider that when we remove these and and now our officers are going out and having to do. Uh, state summonses and the affidavit requirements and everything that goes into filing these into county court. Um, it's it's definitely not. Uh, it's going to take additional time and resources in order to to uh, handle that within the the police department, as okay. opposed to being able to handle these through the mis municipal court. Okay, I see Doug uh, Wilson. Doug, do you have a comment or did you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the council. Yeah, I I do. I'm I'm actually I talked to uh, Representative Weissman also Wednesday and then again last night. Um, and I'm torn as the public defender because I'm just gonna. I don't think we have enough data to make a decision. For instance, one of the things that Councilmember Zavonik was talking about were outcomes. I don't know what the conviction rates are, for instance, for uh, uh, um, district attorney. Kellner's office and district attorney Mason's office is compared to ours. I know what, how many cases are dismissed that we handle that are DVs. And, and I think from a victim's perspective and a defendant's perspective, how many cases are resolved that maybe shouldn't have been brought or are dismissed for whatever reasons on the day of trial? I mean, that's, you guys have heard me do the broken record on this, but 
For instance, today, I have 820 cases in our office. 305 of those are DVs. Uh, and last year, we had a 56% dismissal rate of those cases. Um, and I, that's not a criticism of the prosecutors. I think because there's a different process from the police department here are the charging document, uh, charging agent in municipal court versus prosecutors of the charging agent in state court. So some cases may not be charged. Some cases may be resolved early. Um, but that's part of the important and Judge Day was talking about the application of the Victims' Rights Act, which I would hope you all would support um, that that become part of it. I, I truly am torn. I think if there was a better job of reviewing charges, there wouldn't be such a high dismissal rate here. And I think you would want to know what county court in the 17th and 18th would look like if those cases went there. Understanding that the fiscal note will be huge because I, I've been told that state PD would need at least 25 attorneys, which is going to be a million dollars worth of a couple million dollars worth of uh, fiscal notes. So anyway, that's I, I'm I'm completely torn as to whether it should go because it will take 300 cases out of my office if it were to happen. Um, just a quick question. Well, a question to, to Judge Day and maybe Peggy. Um, is there, is Rep. Wiseman and the Speaker Duran, are they still going to be open to have conversations with our, with our, you know, our judges? Or is it just continuing yeah. that? Are they willing to have those discussions still no. as, this, as this is progressing? Because there seems sure. to be a lot of different um, issues. I wrote down several from our police department to, you know, our district attorneys to our you know, municipal courts. So there seems to be a lot of things that needs to be considered on this. Yeah, absolutely. They're for sure willing to have continued discussions about it. I think they know that it's a big bill because it's the majority leader's bill. There's no deadline on it. So there's no rush to introduce it. Um, and like I said, they're in the middle of a ton of stakeholders meetings on it. So we'll keep, we'll keep in contact with the proponents for sure. And representative Weissman and, um, get updates as they're starting to craft and figure out if they're going to make dramatic changes, um, completely pivot or tweak around the edges. So we'll keep you posted on, on, uh, what they decide to do after all these stakeholder meetings. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anything else? Um, who's speaking? He wants to have a further conversation too. Sorry. Oh, Judge Day, I'm sorry. I interrupted you. No, 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 you didn't. I, I apologize. I didn't mean to. I was just following Peggy in saying that Rep. Weissman did at the end of our meeting say that uh, he would be reaching out to have further conversation. So. Okay. Thank you, Judge Day. Councilmember yeah. Jurinski. Yeah, I don't know. Just something I was thinking in my head, and I guess my perspective of domestic violence. Um, is is just very different. I feel like it's uh, been so watered down uh, nowadays. And Chief Hildebrand, I know you're on. Um, it is true, right, that someone can be arrested for domestic violence for calling calling a name, right? For calling calling someone an egregious name, um, like the B word, the C word, stuff like that. Someone can be arrested. That can be considered domestic violence. Um, it, you have to have an underlying criminal charge. So if there's a threat or harassment, and then it was in a in a domestic violence situation that it was um, used against a, a domestic partner to intimidate or show, display control over. Yes, that that could potentially be, but it, it still has to meet the underlying criminal charge of whatever that is, if, whether it's a harassment or a threat. Yeah. Uh, so yes, that has to be um, that has to be there, but it could potentially. Yeah, I guess they've just seen it. I mean, owning bars, I have just seen it too many times uh, where women use this as a tool um, and call 911 and say, he called me the B word. I have literally seen men be arrested over this. So domestic violence has been so watered down um, to take away from, from the protection of someone like physically being assaulted, I mean, physically violence, right? Domestic violence, not not words. 
Um, is there any way to maybe look at this as like the level, the level of domestic violence? Some some go to county and some stay stay at the municipal level. It, would that be helpful at all to to maybe have those conversations with uh, Representative? Weissman, I don't know. I'm just putting that out there. Like domestic violence is uh hey, council member. Mm -hmm. Just from a law enforcement perspective, we don't really look at whether it's going into county or municipal. We just we're looking at whether or not we establish probable cause that a crime has been committed and we have to affect the arrest. So <laughs> typically if there is a municipal charge that applies and there's a, a you know if there's a county charge and there's a matching one within the municipal code, we're going to file it into municipal, typically municipal court. That doesn't mean it doesn't take away our ability to file it into county court. We can certainly have that ability to do that, but we file them through where the most applicable charges are. And yeah. so if, if we have one of those instances where, you know, it is like a threat or something or harassment or whatever, if we typically can file it into either, but with probable cause was established, it's a mandatory arrest. And I think that goes to Mr. Wilson's point, the high uh, dismissal rate, you know, since it is a mandatory arrest, whether or not the victim is cooperative or not, if we have probable cause, we're gonna affect the arrest. And typically once we get down the road, the victim's uncooperative, the likelihood of a successful prosecution kind of goes out the window because they're recanting or something else and we get those high dismissal rates. And I don't know if they'd be any different county wise versus municipal wise. I think you probably experienced that same level of this, you know, of these cases falling through at those levels. But um, as far as using it as a as a tool, I'm of the mind and I personally am, you still have to, you still have to establish that probable cause standard that a crime has been committed. Yeah. And just yeah. saying, I'm gonna take the benefit of the doubt yeah. for, the, for a understand. female that makes an allegation, I still have to show that there was- um, I understand situation. that, but I have seen time and time again where women say, um, he called me a bitch and threatened to hit me. That has established the probable cause. And then because of the slanderous word, they're arrested. I have seen it. I have seen mm -hmm. men arrested out of my bar and their lives destroyed over this. So what I'm saying is there's different levels of domestic violence. And, and this really wouldn't have anything to do with the local police department. What I'm saying is maybe this, maybe is this a bigger conversation? I mean, Doug's saying half of the cases of in, in his office right now are domestic violence cases. And of those half, I can only imagine um, that 75% are probably what I am what I am saying right now is classified as domestic violence. So what I'm saying is that is it worth having a bigger conversation with Weissman, with somebody at the state level and saying maybe it's not all or nothing, maybe, you know, we we separate um, severities of domestic violence cases. It was just, it's just a suggestion. And I don't know, Sean, uh, how you feel about that or Doug, how you feel about that. Um, but I just see domestic violence, the charge of domestic violence um, now is, is so watered down, so watered down um, that maybe we split up severity levels. I don't know. And Council Member Jarinski, that may be something we can discuss. I think we probably want to see how this develops, um, what it's going to turn out to. But is that maybe Judge Day and you know Doug can maybe consider that or look into that? But right now we just have a general summary. So um, just monitor maybe. Well, we're not taking any kind of position. This is just kind oh. of informational right now. Okay. Okay. I got it. So as we bring it back, Council Member Jarinski, then I think we can see maybe you know, tailor it, kind of look at it a little bit more, but right now it's just a summary and it doesn't really have any, a lot of substance to it right now. Got it. Okay. So, okay. Um, anything else on this issue from the committee? Okay. Thank you, Judge Day. Thank you, Doug um, and Chief for giving your um, opinions on this as well. I appreciate it. Thank um, you, Madam Chief, for adding topic it. topic is going to be juvenile detention bed space. Chief Hildebrand. Hello everyone. Um, I, this topic was brought up at our last uh, Pfizer meeting. Uh, when we spoke about the bed space, I was given some action items um, to kind of meet, get get with the district attorney. Uh, I actually have conversations with district attorney uh, John Kellner. Uh, I've also uh, learned about a new initiative that's um, being pushed by um, the Colorado Youth uh, Detention Consortium through the Department of Human Services. So 
um, a little bit of an update on where we're at with this. Currently, there's 215 beds within the state of Colorado. Uh, the CYDC, their consortium um, met. They uh, came together and they're pushing forward a proposal to increase bed space across the state by 10% with an additional 10% of flexibility where they don't need uh, approval from the legislature. They just need to have the uh, director of DHS approve that additional 10%. So you're, that would be a maximum of 20% increase in bed space. What they are trying to do is since the legislative session starts J July 1st, um, they're trying to get an addendum to the current uh, legislation so that can take place as soon as possible. Um, I think that is going to move forward. I don't know what the result of that will be and if the le legislator will entertain that request, but it is um, the CYDC requesting it and, and not, uh, you know, it's they're actually experiencing it um, through uh, the Depar Department of Human Services. So I think they have a lot of leverage to, to maybe accomplish that. I know DA Kellner uh, is taking a position that he is asking just for increased bed space. He hasn't determine what number that would look like or, uh, but across the state, he's lobbying with the uh, DA council to support that. I know uh, several of the DAs here locally support that, but across the state, he has a feeling that he's gonna have a hard time getting support um, from the DA council to move forward uh, against the legislator because of uh, the dynamics right now there. Uh, our chief is very much in support of increasing uh, bed space uh, amongst juveniles because we've seen such an influx of violent crime amongst our juvenile population and they're not being uh, for violent crimes not being held. So I know our position is, is that we really need to see an increase. I don't think 20% is going to be sufficient. Uh, e even though it is a good starting point and we're seeing maybe a pushback in the right direction. But I think this is going to be have to be an issue um, if that gets approved, even in July, that um, there's some lobbying to even increase that more. Um, and I know uh, Council Member Savonic uh, has some uh, has a potential proposal uh, resolution, um, you know, to even eliminate a bed space cap, which I think um, from our standpoint, and I think we all in law enforcement agree is that we're definitely not saying we need to fill every bed, whatever that number is, but we need to have enough beds to be able to house those juvenile that are the most violent and for their safety and the community's safety. So, and that's where we're at right now. We do not have adequate bed space to do that. And I don't know if you can arbitrarily place a def definitive number on that because it is a it is fluctuate. And if there's empty beds, then that's great. Then Then we know we have enough beds uh, if we do have an increase in violence, we have a place um, for our youth population that are involved in violence to go uh, pending their trial. So that's kind of an update of where we're at now. Uh, I think from the counter standpoint and our standpoint, we're hoping that the Department of Human Services director can get uh, can get this passed through to at least get that 20 percent um, increase uh, across the state. But for instance, in in uh, Arapahoe County, that's probably at a maximum eight more beds. Um, and then in uh, Adams County, where they have 17 beds, you know, 20% is, you know, it's that's not that many more bed bed addition. Uh, so it, it's definitely challenging. Council Member Jarinski and Council Member Zavonik, we heard, uh, Council Member Zavonik, we know your position about what you wanna bring um, to with no cap. So, do you have any questions for uh, Chief Hildebrand on this issue with what we just discussed? I don't, I don't have any questions. I would just say, uh, you know, thanks for the update. I, I'm, I'm happy to hear those conversations about increasing it. Clearly, whether it's increase a, a no cap would be best, especially given the focused deterrence program we're looking at bringing to the city. Um, I think it's an arbitrary number. It's not enough, but I also realize that we have to take what we can get. So. Uh, eight more in the Arapahoe and four more in, in Adams is, is better than nothing. But I hope that we continue to make the case because it's the right policy for our city, for our residents. And frankly, for these these young kids who are committing violent crimes, it's the right policy for them um, to not have uh, a cap at all. And Peggy, I just have a question. So um, there is no, is anything being drafted on this right now? Or is this 
So based on our last meeting, I reached out to the DA's council. Um, they said they were not bringing a bill. Their lobbyists said they weren't bringing a bill or asking for an increase this session. They certainly understood the need for an increase in beds. Um, it sounds like um, uh, from Captain Hildebrand that it, um, it, it perhaps is the Department of Human Services that's now looking at that. So. I'll reach out to Department of Human Services and um, see if this is something that they're either bringing legislatively or maybe just through the budget process. Um, but let me let me do a little bit more research on um, on human services side of things and see if they have any insight for us. Yeah, if you could provide an update on that, I would greatly appreciate it. Council Member Zavonic. Yeah, question uh, procedurally for you and for um, and maybe for Peggy. So. Uh, let's assume that uh, the resolution I bring forward that we decide we want, we like it, we move it forward to the full council, it gets six plus votes. And so we as a city say we want to actively pursue a policy of uh, eliminating the cap. Let's assume that happens, right? I know it has to happen before it does. But if that does happen, can we then take work with you, Peggy, and your team to identify a legislator to introduce a bill so that we're being proactive on this? And the reason why I say that is that we hear from our residents all the time. Uh, about how concerned they are with youth violence in our community and, and violence in general, but this youth this youth violence challenge that we face. And, and this is something that's out of our hands as municipal leaders. And I believe we have to do everything we possibly can. And part of that would be working with, um, you know, a, a member of our delegation out of Aurora to say, hey, would you be willing, the, the, the city of Aurora and our city council has expressed a desire to see an elimination of this cap. Will you be willing to carry it? And can we work with you and your team to identify that person? It procedurally, we do. You bet. I mean, absolutely. We can certainly go talk to legislators, specifically starting with our delegation, try to find somebody to sponsor a bill. Um, as you know, we are now into the session. Most legislators already have their first five bills. So we'd probably be in a position where they'd need to go and ask for a late bill from leadership. They'd need two out of three um, signatures from leadership. So that may be um, a little bit of a sticky point, um, but certainly something we could ask. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Thank or you for the budget process. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, that may be. Yeah, through the long bill process. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that might be more viable. Yep. Okay, thanks. I'll report back after I talk with human services and send you guys an update. Okay, thank you, Peggy. Um, yeah. Before we move on to water update, I see Totsi Totsi. Um, we have council member Zavonik um, on, and I just wanted you to introduce yourself before, you know, council member Jarinski, she was on the committee last year. Hello, and I apologize for being late. Another meeting kind of overlaps this one. Councilman, council member Zavonik, it's nice to see you again. And Council Member Jarinski, it's nice to see you again as well. Appreciate your time and your diligence on these matters. And Peggy and I'll work on this stuff and try to get you some more answers on the beds, DV. That's where I came in. So we'll chat and thanks for your support. Appreciate okay, thank it. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy, and thank you, Totsi. I appreciate all the updates and all the um, conversations on the state legislative update. So now we're gonna move over to water update and who is presenting on water update? Madam Chair, it's uh, Jeff okay. Seaman. Oh, hey, hi, Jeff, and hi, Adam. You said Adam as well? Oh, just you, okay. Just me. Okay, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> thank you. I'm. Uh, Filling in today for uh, Kathy Kitzman, who is in another meeting and not able to join your committee. Uh, I have a very brief update, uh, starting with just introducing myself, uh, especially to the two new committee members. Um, my name is Jeff Seaman. I'm a lobbyist at the Capitol. I have a firm by the name of Colorado Advocates. We have represented Aurora Water now for, I think, we're in our fifth year, and um, again, I'm filling in for Kathy Kitzman, who would normally be providing this report for the department. Um, really just two items to share. One is, you'll recall at the last meeting, Madam Chair, you approved the department joining a letter 
to the Uniform Commission on State Laws, opposing a bill uh, that has been adopted in other states, but that has the potential to interfere with Colorado water rights. And uh, we penned a letter with uh, Northern Water via the Colorado Water Congress and sent that letter into the Uniform Commission, which is meeting this afternoon. Our hope is that they will uh, heed our request that they not advance that as a bill for the coming session. Uh, happy to go into any level of depth that you might want on that, but in short, that uniform bill, model bill that's been adopted in other states does not comport well with uh, the complexity of Colorado water law, and that's the basis for the Aurora water uh, op opposition to that uh, concept. Um, Last item really I have is that uh, water is uh, being mentioned as one of the top uh, priorities for the legislature, the legislative session that convened this week. Um, so far it's been uh, mentioned really just in broad strokes and there's been no specificity around what that means. We know that there will be a lot of focus from the governor's office and others on water conservation. Obviously, Aurora is a leader statewide in that topic, so we'll be watching that uh, closely. There will likely be a whole raft of other water bills as well, but again, at least to this point, it's been just sort of broadly mentioned as a priority for obvious reasons, the drought, Colorado River situation, et cetera, uh, but no uh, specificity to, to hang on that conversation at this moment. So I'll stop there, happy to answer any questions. Uh, but that is our report for your committee today. Thank you, Jeff. Is there any questions from the committee to Jeff on anything that he stated today on the water um, water information that he provided? Nope. Okay. Okay, thank you, Jeff. We look forward to working with you as well. So thank you for um, providing the update. Appreciate it. Likewise, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, miscellaneous matters for consideration. So I want to bring up one uh, miscellaneous matter um, that I would like for our, my committee to be considering. So um, I would like to at least have at least one in-person meeting um, a month. So I wanted, I don't, I want to start this in February. So I want to go, we'll do our next meeting virtually. I mean, you know, uh, virtually through Zoom. And then in February, I would like to ask the committee and we can maybe decide at the next meeting, but we probably need to make sure for planning purposes, if we want the first meeting or the second meeting of the month to be in person. And I would like to do one a month. I think two is gonna be a little challenging, but if we could do one a month, and first of all, before I move forward on that, would the committee be willing to have one a meeting in person at the city building one one um, one meeting per month, yes. in person. Yes, I am as well. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, so we'll we will start doing that in February. So just to kind of get a planning, our planning ahead, we have a meeting on, if we keep within the two weeks, February tenth, and then the next one is February twenty fourth. Um, and we can discuss these monthly, but just to kind of get in preparation for next month, so we can make sure we have the room um, at where we need to be, where we can have capability for people who are virtual as well. Because Peggy, I understand you may have to come from the Capitol, so this is just in person, um, but you can virtually do it. Um, would you like to have it the, the first meeting in person on the 10th or on the 24th, or do you want to discuss it at the next meeting after you look at calendars? The 10th would be fine for me. Councilmember Jarinski? Yeah, I'm fine with either. The 10th is fine. Okay. So um, for Cynthia or whoever arranges our meeting, Liz, we're going to have our first in person meeting on February 10th. And again, Peggy, I understand you'll be at the Capitol. So we'll have that virtual, I mean, you know, that capability where you can chime in. And Chair, okay. we're keeping it at one. We're yes. staying at one. Okay. Yes. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, um, Liz, I'm going to let you do our final thing for miscellaneous and then I'll turn it over to the committee to see if they have anything and then we'll adjourn this. We'll confirm the next meeting and then we'll adjourn. Of course, um, Roberto, I know you are going to make a discussion statement about session this year. So would you like sure. to go ahead? <clears throat> yeah, Liz had asked me to, to, to touch on this one just since she's, she's new to the process. And so I'll just do, it's more of a reminder of what we've done in the past. 
Council Member Lawson, you can fill in here. We have uh, uh, we will continue to do the the process where we take positions, obviously per council rule and FSIR in this committee, uh, and then the subsequent study session after these meetings, we'll provide those bills that you've taken positions to the study session and allow council members if they have any of those bills to call out for discussion. We'll do that. Otherwise, the position of the Pfizer committee will stand. Um, and so we also earlier Liz had sent a bill tracker with uh, that is the bills that we are tracking that Peggy and her team have sent over to Liz and we've circulated to staff. So you can always see at any point what bills are in the queue. If there are bills that you want to add to please let us know, we'll add them into the queue and get them circulated to departments. And then if we have any positions, obviously, on any of the bills that we're recommending. Uh, and then in terms of testimony and testifying on bills, uh, we have. Um, Council members, mayor, uh, staff at various points um, over the years have always uh, gone down to the Capitol to testify in support or in opposition to bills. Uh, we tend to only go on bills that we are actively opposing or supporting that we really want to kind of save our our uh, our political capital for the bills that we really care about. So, but in any event, sometimes there are bills, obviously, where um, we're not all in agreement. And so, if there's a bill that, uh, and we will send this out to council just kind of as a refresher to discuss it. If there's a bill that we take an official position, obviously, you can go down and testify on behalf of the city and on behalf of the Aurora City Council. But if it's not, we will only ask that just the council member or the mayor just indicate that they're testifying on, on as an individual and not on behalf of the city. That's really the only thing that we ask. And then the second thing we ask is just to make sure that we try to give Peggy and, and Liz a heads up just so that they know and can help with anything you guys need down at the Capitol, signing up. I know sometimes it's a long wait down there, but I just wanted to uh, just remind uh, the committee of those particular things and that we'll send that out to the rest of the council because I know the mayor goes down on several bills to testify uh, on. And so that will be the process. If there's any questions, concerns about that process, let us know. But I think that's how we've handled in the past, and usually we're able to to handle most circumstances that come up during the session. So just wanted to give a a courtesy reminder. Okay, thank you, Roberto. And I just want to just emphasize, I mean, you, you please go down there and testify on whatever you want to do, especially if it's something that you, you know, just please just acknowledge that you're doing it on your behalf because I have gotten um, council members not only from the committee, but council members who have went down there and they may have not been recognized that they're testifying on their own behalf. And then I get calls from legislators saying, oh, I thought that that was the position of the city, but now we have this council member down here saying this is the position. And it really puts me in a real um, precarious pr situation as, long as, as, as well as with the city and our lobbyists. So I just ask for my members and committee just to make sure you just even if you could just let me know you're going down there. You could do testify on whatever you want to testify on. Just chair, I can let we're in those type of procedurals. Yes, Councilmember Jarinski. You know, right now, as soon as these two bills, um, once Peggy finds them, the two bills that are coming forward about DHS um, and CPS, uh, regardless of the position of this committee, I can tell you that I am already on the list to go down and testify. So I'm letting this committee know right now um, if. If this committee takes a position of actively supporting, I, you know, I can mention my capacity and I think it'll be pretty known, but I, I plan to, I, I'm telling you right now that those two, I will be down at the Capitol. Okay, and I, and I appreciate the, um, to let me know about that Councilman Jarinski and you're fine to do that. Just, you know, when you go down there, you're testifying unless we take in positions or whatever, just, you know, that you're testifying on your own behalf on these bills. That's yeah. all I'm asking procedurally. Yep. Yep. No problem. Okay. Um, so is there any other miscellaneous matters from the committee that you want to bring up that we need to consider for the next meeting? Um, our next meeting is set for January 27th at, um, at 1 o'clock. I do want to let the committee know. I know that these meetings are, they, sometimes they may go for an hour, but sometimes they may go for an hour and a half and sometimes they may go for 2 because the legislative session is just going to be like that. So, um, please bear with me on this and, um, is there any other questions or concerns? And if not, we'll be meeting on the 27th. Council member Jarinski, council member Zavonic. I don't have anything. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for a great meeting. I will be seeing everybody on the 27th and have a great weekend. You too. Bye. See everybody. Thank you.